making the effort on such a beautiful sunny day in the Irish summer to, to make it here. Really do appreciate you making the effort. So uh, this morning, we, we, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a bit of a mashup of, of different topics in relation to cyber threats. And I'm going to fly through them quite quickly um, uh, at, a, at a fairly gusto pace um, so that we can get a, a taste or a flavour for exactly what we're going to go through today because what I don't want to do is um, uh, infringe on other people's material. They're going to go to a much deeper level than I will on these, but what I want to do is just give you a taste for, for what's coming up. So a little bit about myself. As Rich said, I've, I've two decades experience in the world of uh, information security in those related areas. Uh, these days, for marketing reasons, I go under the title of Cyber Threat Advisor, which is quite cool. Um, so a little bit about the ICTTF to give you a background of why we're here today. The ICTTF is the International Cyber Cyber Threat Task Force. That task force is a not-for-profit group that's been put together as a security community to put like-minded people together that want to share information, share knowledge, exchange ideas, and advise each other on how to deal with these new types of threats that are in the marketplace. It's not for going strictly to uh, uh, IT vendors. Or the, you need specialists who are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis and working on it, whether it's forensics, whether it's dealing on any specialist area of governance, risk, and compliance. It all is like one big Venn diagram and all these areas land and this is a community where you can go um, and there's no cost involved to exchange ideas and become part of the solution as they say in relation to that. So uh, the community site has a lot of different facilities on it everything from videos, blogs and so on like that um, and it's a good place so if you've got some time sign up check it out you will learn stuff and there's a lot of good knowledge exchange on the on the site itself. So a little bit about the blurred lines of cyber threats and we very purposefully call this cyber threats it's not cyber crime it's not cyber warfare it's not cyber terrorism. This is about cyber threats. They're the different types of risks which overlap each other in relation to this. So some would call it cyber warfare, some call it cyber terrorism, some to it cyber crime, others would call it cyber scum. So, and we go through some of these. So these are different areas that are these different types of threat, if you like, that are out there. And they're made, made up as we go through some demonstrations. It's not all technical stuff, right? It's not all about the, the sort of technical threat. It's also about social engineering. It's also about the people. It's about processes. It's about good governance. It's about good risk management. It's about all these things that you need to have in place in order to have a good, robust defensive mechanism in, in, in place around this. So cybercrime. Okay, I did say I'd be quick, didn't I? So I'll go pretty turbo mode here. So cybercrime essentially, hopefully I'm not blocking too much of the screen here. Uh, cybercrime is essentially um, any crime that's committed using the internet or uh, using uh, computers or any technology really falls into the, the realm of, of cybercrime uh, on that side. Cyber warfare uh, is taken deadly serious these days. So uh, Richard there mentioned about what's happening in the UK, about generals being put in charge. It's the same in the States. Some countries are, are calling for conscription into uh, um, uh, army divisions which will actually become hacking groups uh, to defend countries and to attack countries if need be. Uh, the digital infrastructure, as said by Barack Obama, is part of a, a strategic national asset in May 2010. You've got a four-star general and put him in charge of Cybercom. Um, there's massive budgets behind this. This is not just another marketing gimmick by the IT industry or the security industry, whatever. This is real. This stuff goes on every day. As anybody who's seen the news in the last few months will understand everything from Lockheed Martin, from the IMF, from RSA. Nobody is safe when it comes to cyber threats and, and how, they, how they, uh, ca they can be uh, dealt with. So the Economist recently referred to this as the fifth domain in relation to warfare. You've land, you've sea, you've air, you've space, and now you've cyberspace. Okay. So uh, we also have to mention there the term cyber scum, which is basically any of that horrible stuff that's out there in relation to, which can be seen as a threat to an organization as well as obviously uh, to society itself in relation to what goes on and that sort of stuff. Just one interesting thing, about a year ago, the RTE uh, put a primetime documentary in relation to this sort of content. And uh, uh, it was interesting because it caused a lot of controversy at the time. They ran some scanning software across the Irish internet to detect known child porn. That's known by MD5 hashes. This is the known hardcore stuff, not the barely blah, 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 and, and the, the vagueness stuff for people dressed up to look like, like younger than they are and stuff like this. This was known hardcore child porn. In that one month period, they detected 1,000 people in 30 days that were downloading in Ireland. 697 were spotted one, once, two times, 397, three or more times. So this is something prevalent and very even local, uh, and it's not isolated, obviously, just to, to, to Ireland. So. How do we look about this? Let's try and put some structure on this. We can, uh, we can look at the different attack categories that people can have. Um, we have criminal attacks, so there are people around fraud, theft, grand larceny, identity theft, spoofing, that sort of stuff. Now, don't forget, 
a lot of these crimes are there for donkey's years, well before the internet. The internet and cyber technology is just a new way of perpetrating the same sort of crime and the same sort of uh, uh, techniques are being used, just using a different vector of attack. And even the attacks we see these days are just new ways of doing things in, in, a, in a cyber way, in the fighting ways. You can have a destructive attack, so that's something like cyber terrorism that's crashing down a website, taking out some critical national infrastructure, whatever it happens to be. You have nerd attacks. Okay, nerd attacks are done just for, for the, the show-off value, to the, the prowess. So we look at somebody like Lulsec and the group, uh, and what, what they've done, and a lot of that was just actually just to show people up and show what could be done and so on like that. And we have increasingly the espionage attacks, so cyber espionage. And I go through towards the end of this presentation, you see where I talk about the uh, distinct groups that are starting around the tax where you have low-hanging fruit, which is the day-to-day -day mundane cybercrime of carding, identity theft, stealing money from people's accounts, all that good stuff. And now what you have is the big earner is cyber espionage. That's stealing intellectual property from organizations. Two-thirds of any company is made up of their secrets. If you can get their secrets, whether it's a marketing plan, whether it's the formula for, for, for something, whether it's patents, whatever it happens, to be, you can, you can uh, control the value of that company to a certain extent, especially if you can control uh, the perception in the market of what's happening to that company. So we see uh, pump and dump scams and so on, which I'll go through a little bit. So each sector then, so depending on what sector you're in, you'll have your own group of cyber criminals or people that are going to attack uh, uh, or that you are a target for. So we have fishers, and they tend to go after. So phishing sites, I know most of you will be familiar with, with this term, but they're, they're the sort of emails that you get pretending to be a particular bank and saying, please click here um, to update your, your, your password, or please click here to update your, your phone number details, whatever it happens to be. They, they harvest your details, they take your details, they start building up a profile in order to uh, either sell your information or use it to... Uh, uh, to, to, to to, for some other nefarious activity. We have industrial spies. We have IP companies that'll go out there. I mean, a lot of this comes in from, from China and that side of stuff where we see people trying to steal intellectual property. Interestingly, the head of the Secret Service in the UK um, uh, just a couple of years ago actually wrote to the top 300 companies in the UK telling them that they need to presume that they've been compromised, that this it wasn't uh, something that they, they, they could suspect had happened. They had to actually presume that their intellectual property had been stolen. And we've seen massive cases of this, for example, even Cisco and people like that, who's... Uh, intellectual property and details have been stolen and cloned and that, and that sort of stuff. And there's lots of stories on the internet about that. Excuse me, I knew the last coffee was a mistake. So uh, the, um, we also have hackers who will scout for prestige or for money. We have cyber terrorists who just want to hurt the West. And we have fraudsters who are just looking to siphon cash. Okay, so the recent stuff in the news. What sort of groups have we got? We have got Anonymous, we've got Lulsec. A lot of this stuff came from WikiLeaks um, and originated from there, and, and uh, we had Operation Payback. The bottom line is, okay, um, there's many reasons why people get involved in this, but, but the thing to keep in mind is, this is easy. right? It's easy to become part of one of these groups. It's easy to become part of, essentially, an army. Right, that has a lot of power and is able to do very destructive things. It's not always about trying to get money. Sometimes it is just about actually having an impact. Right? So it, it, it's almost the street riot is now the cyber street riot, if you like, from that side of the street. They can actually go up, they can do their vandalism up online. And a lot of the people, that my experience of dealing with Lulsec, and I've had a lot of recent experience dealing with them, um, they're kids. Um, this isn't something orchestrated where some of the other groups are a little bit more sinister and a little bit more thought out where they're actually trying to affect the reputation of companies. Because by affecting the reputation of a company, you affect their stock price. By affecting their stock price, you can make shed loads of money. All right, so, and usually you just follow the money to find out what's going on. So if we look at the threat groups then of people and how they all, how they all come about, you've got criminals, or sorry, we've gone through that one. So, sorry, straight into the law side of things, I want to give you a little bit of dabble of, of this stuff. So on the law side, we have the uh, 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 computer crime legislation in relation to the European Convention of Cybercrime. And this is something for probably at least the, the, the last year, this slide has been in my slide deck every time we talk about Ireland's nearly there to ratify this. We're really going to make this the law. The effect is, this isn't from the, the, the European community. This, this, they're not an organ of, of the, the European, uh, uh, they're a separate body who've put together this de facto standard in relation to criminal law. So they define the different types of offences and so on like that. So for example, now you have America signed up for this, right? Um, it, so it's not part of the, the European community itself. Uh, interesting what's about it is they define the offences, but directors and business need, need to understand they can use laws like this to defend themselves and to go after people for attribution and so on like that. But at the end of the day, 
they also have to comply with it, which is actually, so it's a double-edged sword, if you like, because on that side of things is actually what really wakes uh, uh, people up. Because if we look at Article 12, Paragraph 2, which I know you're all very familiar with, um, we see that to ensure that a legal person can be held liable where the lack of supervision or control by a natural person has made possible the commission of a criminal offence established in accordance with the Convention. In other words, if your systems are compromised and used as part of a crime, you potentially, uh, if you're a director of an organisation, can be held liable, or your organisation can be held liable for that. So you need to have the controls in place to prevent this stuff happening. If you do not have sufficient controls, potentially, uh, that, that is what, what this law is saying. So, take a moment now, we talk about is it real? There's been a lot of stuff in the news recently, and uh, I know uh, it was, it's a year ago now, uh, there, but, but people have talked uh, a lot about Stuxnet. And so well, what's the Stuxnet thing, Paul? Is it just another virus? Because, let's be honest, we can become desensitised to this stuff. Ah! It's a virus, ah, it's malware, ah, it's spyware, ah, oh, I have something in place for that, right? It's no longer that simple when it comes to this stuff. Um, so if we look at, I'm going to look at a brief video here on Stuxnet, and we see this is something, and I, I do some work with, with NATO, and we could talk about that in a second, but um, this is the first virus that created a kinetic attack. So it can create a physical attack. So it was designed and put together to attack what's known as the SCADA systems of nuclear reactors and could cause them potentially to explode or whatever they need to be. It was also, we say, well, is there cyber warfare? This virus was aimed particularly at the Iranians. So um, it, it had a footprint on it and so on like that. Uh, there's massive amount of research and money went into creating this particular virus. However, the virus is actually for sale on the black market now and can be easily edited and used against anything in particular. So we look at a quick video on this. In June last year, a computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the data banks of power plants, traffic control systems and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines and Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. Unlike most viruses, Stuxnet doesn't carry the usual forged security clearance that helps viruses burrow into systems. It actually had a real clearance, stolen from one of the most reputable computer technology companies in the world. It exploited security gaps that system creators are unaware of. These holes are known as zero days, and the most successful viruses exploit them. The details of a zero day can be sold on the black market for $100,000. Stuxnet took advantage of 20 zero days. But once it got into a system, it didn't always activate. Buried deep in the Stuxnet code was a specific target. Without that target, the virus remained dormant. What was it looking to shut down? The centrifuges that spin nuclear material at Iran's enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was a weapon the first to be made entirely out of code. The Washington-based Institute for Science and International Security says the virus may have shut down a thousand centrifuges at Natanz, Iran's main enrichment facility, last year. In November, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog, said Iran had suspended work at its nuclear facilities without explaining why. Many observers credited Stuxnet. Last month, the Iranian government conceded the virus's infection of the Bashir nuclear facility, still under construction, meant that switching the plant on could lead to a national electricity blackout. Iran has responded to the attack with an open call for hackers to join the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and has reportedly amassed the second largest online army in the world. So who was behind Stuxnet? There's no evidence beyond rumour. Some have it that Israel is responsible because the virus code apparently contains references to the Hebrew Bible. Others believe the US was involved in the testing and development. The finger has even been pointed at Siemens mobile phone company, whose software is used by the Iranian regime. The most important question may not be who designed it, but who will redesign it. The evolution has been so fast that nine months after its detection, the first virus that could crash power grids or destroy oil pipelines is available online for anyone to download and tinker with. You can watch people on YouTube pulling Stuxnet apart. It's an open source weapon. 
And there's no way of knowing who will use it or what they will use it for. Okay, so we can see there that this is something that's come on in huge leaps in recent times and it's something because of the proliferation of information. Um, there's this underground economy that, that I often speak of in relation to why people are teaching people for free how to get into this because it is an economy. You sell them tools, you sell them know-how and, the, and you're creating customers for yourself if you're a criminal in, in the underground. So. Reasons for escalation. There's many, many reasons. This is just some of them for, uh, that, that, that I've put together. The, uh, it is a business. It has an excellent economic model. It's right around the, 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 the complete world. They teach people from newbies the whole way up. They have recurring clients and so on like that. They have multiple exchange data. They have no taxes, no legislation to deal with, anything else like that. And it's growing. By all estimates, it's a trillion dollar economy. According to most of the, 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 the surveys that, that you read, it surpassed drug trafficking as the number one crime of organized crime because it's easy to get into it's very difficult to get caught. I mean, look at Stuxnet. They don't even know who put Stuxnet together. You know, they just suspect. Um, a lot of the the, uh, the the events that have happened even around Lulsec and so on, you see how difficult it actually is to attribute these incidents to, to actual individuals and so on like that. And we'll touch upon then, well, where does that leave you at the end of the day, um, uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation? So it's broken down into distributors, uh, resellers, wholesalers, and so on. Just brief slide on that. But one of the main reasons behind this is, I mentioned there, it's easy. Well, it is easy because there's been a malicious tool uh, evolution, if you like, and there's a whole other industry created called Crimeware, where people are creating tools to teach you how to do this and make it easy. They have beautiful user interfaces that you can use. You just follow and click and so on like that, and, and you're up and going within minutes. Um, so by way of a, uh, a, an example, I have one coming up here, but um, you can see a lot of this stuff. If anybody has any curiosity in this, go on to YouTube, go on to Google, whatever. Just type in Crimeware or type in you, you, you know hacking tutorial, whatever and you'll be led very quickly into somewhere that will sell you the know-how and sell you the tools on, on how to do this and how to get involved in uh, uh, crime. Some of this is in the cloud, a oh, great phrase, a great marketing term, the cloud, but some of it is in the cloud. You can actually go on without installing any software. You go in, you can point and click, I want Irish credit card details, please. Uh, I want them just for gold cards, whatever it happens to be, and you buy them on a credit system from, from these systems, and they're popping up and down all over the internet uh, in different territories and different domains. So I just put together a brief example now to show you how one of these things actually work. So getting away from the mundane, uh, where we're talking about almost script kiddies working from their bedrooms that just want to, you know, maybe steal a credit card number and use it to try and purchase something and get away with it. It's all under the radar type stuff or whatever. This is an example of how somebody more a wholesaler type-ish or more uh, seasoned in crime may work. And what they'll do is, let's say, for example, that they, they want to perpetrate credit card fraud, and they, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll get a, a, a toolkit to assist them to do that. So they'll go to a site, something like this site here, um, that they can use to actually uh, buy the tools that'll help them orchestrate that. So they'll go there. Now, they can rent services there. If they don't know how to do any of this whatsoever, they can actually outsource the whole gig uh, to somebody on this website, or they can simply buy the tools they need to do. So for the purpose of this example, we'll use a tool called SpyEye. General price, about $500. Extremely powerful tool that can be used to, to, to perpetrate crime, and so on like that. Freely available, the tutorials, the software, everything is all available up on YouTube. So a legitimate site is actually housing this stuff and the links over to it uh, in relation to that. So first of all, just by way of background, because I know we have an eclectic audience, I just want to explain botnets. Okay, So botnets is essentially uh, an army of infected computers where the, these guys get their power from. So I'll give you a, a quick overview of what they look for. You'll have a guy called a botnet herder, often referred to as the botnet pimp. Uh, he will infect a PC, often known as patient zero, and then infect all the other PCs. And all of those PCs are under his control, so they're bandwidth, they're processing power. Everything that they're going to do is then under, uh, uh, under their power. And what they tend to have is what it's known as a CNC server or a command and control server. That server is often accessed via a number of proxy servers in order to hide their uh, identity so that the tracing can't be done. So they tend to get through there. They connect. They call these, these uh, zombie computers and they tell them what they want to do. And that may be to attack someone with a DDoS attack or to attack someone by sending lots of spam out of those particular machines or whatever. So that's a botnet. And I just want to put that in context to show you the demo of uh, SpyEye. So hopefully you're still with me. To rent a botnet, here's a recent price list uh, courtesy of Adverser, uh, who are the DDoS mitigation providers outside. And if you look here, let's look at this. A five hour, a five gig attack costs 300 sterling to rent. So that's amazing. So who could sustain a five gig attack on the internet? 
for a number of hours and not be marked off offline. So if I can't be bothered going off and infecting thousands of machines to use in my zombie army, I can just rent them. Right? And I can rent all those and actually call those up and use them and just pay the fee for that. So let's look at the SpyEye Toolkit. Step one, I install it on my command and control server. This is what the interface looks like. It's beautiful, it's nice, it's very easy to use. It's pretty buttons and you click on them and they all do certain things and so on like that. So what does it do? First of all, I want to give it credit card numbers. Okay? Now I can get those either from the infected machines and tell them to go off and steal them and bring them up or I can upload a list that I have purchased somewhere from another crime site and put them up into this site. And next step what I do, oops, there we go. The next thing what I do is I go to a shopping site. Okay? Now we're talking about any particular shareware site or any of these that are out there that may sell software for example. It doesn't have to be software but let's use software as an example. Okay? So I take a brand utility or a piece of software, whatever it happens to be, and I upload it and I pretend it's mine. Right? And I put it up for sale. Okay? On this site. Um, and then I kick off the SpyEye server and what that will do is at intermittent times it will use the stolen credit card details to purchase the software and I get the money for it as the criminal. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So the, you've got the transactions going through here, the yellow arrows, and they will go off at different times, so not to detect anything with Digital River or ClickPay or whoever it happens to be is the payment engine behind it, so it doesn't detect it with those guys. Um, and you go through, I sell this bogus software off to people, people are downloading the coolest new utility to convert something onto Max or whatever it happens to be, and they're all downloading it for $20 a piece or whatever, and all the money is coming back over through a money mule and back out to me, the botnet herder, the criminal. Okay, nice and simple crime, Probably pull in 100 grand a month on that, no problem if you're doing it correctly. And that's, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, 100 grand a month is, is easily done. There's also a billing hammer module, right? Just in case you think, oh, well, they'd be detected by Digital River, they'd, they'd cop onto that pretty straight away. This is an interesting one, because what the billing hammer module does, and it's part of SpyEye, is it works out where the stolen credit card was from. Right? So let's say, it's a, oh, this is from Dublin, it's from Malahide, right? or whatever, uh, out there. Right? It will then redirect the transaction out to an infected machine somewhere in Malahide, and then through to the store, and then back out. So the payment engine sees, this is a credit card, it's from Paul, it's Malahide. Oh, the payment's coming through from Malahide. It's okay, let the payment go through. So that's how technical advanced these things are. $500, I'm not exaggerating, in under 10 minutes you'll be up and going with that. Right? It's very simple and straightforward. All the tutorials are there, and they gladly give you customer support. And in fact, I meant to mention on the botnets, they'll actually give you an SLA on botnets, on performance and so on like that. So um, it's, it's actually pretty good stuff. So let's look closer at home. What does all this mean? There isn't any accurate statistics really around Irish side of stuff. There's lots of mid estimates going around and flying about. But if we look at something that is, that is semi accurate, okay? which is cybercrime in the UK. Recent estimates, 27 billion a year. That's 1,000 sterling a second. 170,000 IDs are stolen each year, um, and IP theft is 9.2 billion. If you look at industrial espionage, 7.6 billion, citizens 3.1, and government 2.2. The government 2.2, right? They estimate fiscal fraud in Ireland, that is, dodging social welfare, using fake PPS numbers because you don't have proper identity management is probably costing around two billion a year. Just food for thought there. Maybe some identity management systems put in place will stop cybercrime in relation to, to the fraud in Ireland and so on that's going on uh, uh, against the taxpayers. So the UK's response, they have a minister in charge of this, Baroness Neville Jones, and she is quoted to say, the answer lies in disruption. This is like terrorism. You can't expect to go to law enforcement and say, oh, my website's been attacked. Oh, I think I've been compromised and someone's stolen my data, whatever. It's just not going to work in the real world. You have to rely on the private sector for solutions in order to fit you. Now, when I say solutions, there's service solutions. It's good risk management. There's a, you know, DDoS mitigations, all these sorts of different tools and techniques. It's, it's a mixture, it's a hybrid as I go through of what you need to put this in place. They've put together a substantial budget of 650 million. They're also coordinating everything from the cabinet office to GCHQ and putting it all together to be on one page when it comes to this. Okay, so if we look at the critical national infrastructure, because we've got to start thinking about that. These days, what is the critical national infrastructure? According to governments, it's what they're responsible for. It's the roads, it's maybe the electricity grid, it's maybe the gas supply, stuff like that. But in the real world, the critical national infrastructure is what you guys work in. It's the banks, it's, it, 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 it's society itself and systems that are working around that to give us all what we need, transport and all those sort of things on a day-by-day -day basis. So recently, the Foreign Secretary and it was brought in by David Cameron and a number of the, the industry leaders to put together a strategy on how to deal with this. I myself am involved with NATO, I'm an advisor to NATO on countering hybrid threats. So hybrid threat could be something like Stuxnet and how that might proliferate. It's something to happen, say for example, um, uh, attack 
uh, a nuclear reactor or a track uh, uh, or blow up an oil refinery and how, what is the military response to something like this. So the military plans are being put together at the moment uh, in relation to how to deal with this from a UN basis. Because right, this is that real, and I'm not you know, blowing any way all, all, all the, the stuff is there. So where does the, the history to this? Quick history lesson on this. The person who turned it into econ an economy, if you like, was this guy, Albert Gonzalez. There's lots of Albert Gonzalez since then. Some guys found with 600, 700 million in their bank accounts from being part of this industry. It's a massive industry. Albert Gonzalez started off around 2002 with the shadow crew in the dark market. Even though he was caught by Keith Malarski in the FBI and monitored for two years, they only managed to arrest 28 of 4,000 criminals in those two groups, even though they surveilled them for two years. And these guys are still appearing up all over the world, whether it's Turkey or anywhere. This is just an example of one guy there. So a lot of them are still out there, but they've also shared their knowledge. They've transferred their tools. They've passed it on in relation to all that. People say, what's this information worth? On a very base level, your identity, your, your name, your date of birth, uh, your, your home address, all those sort of things. Easily five bucks on, on, the, uh, on the black economy. You actually sell this sort of information. You get more pertinent information. Uh, for example, the biggest uh, high value information at the moment is medical records on sick children. Right? And people go, oh, what's he mean? And the reason for that is a lot of this has been sold on the underground economy uh, as part of a major scam, where what they'll do is they will contact the parents of the sick children and say, we represent uh, a medical bureau in the States. We have an experimental cure for this particular version of cancer. If you send over $20,000, we can put the child on a treatment program, blah, blah, blah. Horrible bastards is the only way to call a lot of these guys to, 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 be, to be safe. So it's not the Hollywood stuff. It's not the, the fun and hackers and all that good stuff. These are criminals, the terrorists, the people that actually blow up people as well, main people, all this stuff, are behind this. This is organised crime. Uh, this is an example of, of the going rate for credit card details at the moment, about 50 quid uh, for, for, your, for your information. So pump and dump scams. The reason I this is just to elaborate and explain that the big money in this is if you can affect the stock exchange. These are sophisticated crimes. They're also blended threats. So when you see an attack on something like Sony and go, <laughs> isn't that a bit, oh, that's gas, Sony got hit, whatever. What's that about? Is that kids? Is that lulsec? Is that someone showing their prowess? Or is it somebody manipulating the stock value of Sony? Right? The same with other types of companies. And that's what this is about. If you follow the money, you follow what's going on. So what's mainstream now? So a couple of things I want to pick on here around mainstream. Um, the growth, the explosion of social media is now becoming part of cybercrime because it is a place where criminals want to operate. Criminals go where people go. Uh, DDoS is huge. If not just direct DDoS attacks, they're part of a blended attack. Again, I mentioned Sony there. Sony's attack kicked off with a DDoS attack. That distracted all the security people who were looking at that, where they came in, they did what they needed to do in the back door. So it's usually part of attack, a blended type of attack. We have child exploitation material, which I've touched upon earlier on. Uh, PABX fraud. Um, you see a lot of these uh, call cards uh, uh, between ethnic groups being sold all around Ireland and stuff like that. They tend to be working off hacked phone systems so people can phone home to China or phone home to Nigeria, whatever it happens to be, uh, on that side of things. So there's, they're working off, say, a hacked phone system on a small to medium enterprise who doesn't know on a Friday they go off for their break, they come back in on a Monday and they have 10 grand on their phone bill. How do you deal with that if you're a small business with cash flow? You know? uh, so on that side of things. Ransomware. This is when they break into your systems, they encrypt everything, and you pay for the password or you don't get access to your information again. Nice. Um, we have Trojans malware. We'll be going into that in more detail uh, with, with Sophos as well. And we have identity theft. And all of these topics stand up on their own, and we will be touching upon them later in the day, and, and, and they deserve more attention to go through them in, in detail. But I'll click on a couple of them here. Um, we have social media, and people say, oh, well, well what's, what's the risk there? Okay, for most people, social media, social networking is these main sites here, YouTube, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, all that good stuff, right? But actually the truth is that there's kajillions of these sites out there with millions upon millions and hundreds of millions of people in them. ICTTF.org is a social media site. Right? It's a social community of cyber experts, cyber security experts at the end of the day. So if we look at the big daddy and look at some of the stats around that, 500 million users. That's probably gone up since I put this slide together anyway. Uh, you have 900 million objects, 70 languages, 20 million applications installed a day, and 20 million mobile users. Think of the power and potential of that. That's a weapon of mass destruction in itself if somebody compromises Facebook. Right, and all the accounts on Facebook, right? If they have the control over that, there's been lots of story where Facebook aren't exactly um, the best people in the world around people preserving people's identity. There's been cases of them selling on people's identity, or the third-party marketing companies they're using getting access to their data uh, for developers and stuff like that. 
So criminals go where people go. So what we're finding is more and more that they're hanging about the sites like Facebook, trying to use it to social engineer information, to get in with people, to find out what they need to do, or to sell tools, sell techniques. 10% of all internet time is on social media sites. So this is where people are going to be going. Um, it's the third biggest country in the world, Facebook. Right? So it's frightening stuff, and it's only growing. Right? So it's massive, massive power. And I'm not picking just on Facebook. I'm just using that as an example to, 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 to show you where it goes. So now in relation to CROs, um, there's a difference. We're talking here today about cyber threats. We're talking about risk management. Some of the best risk management guys in the business are going to talk today, and Pat is coming after me, Michael Baum as well. And they're going to be talking specifically about risk management techniques and the things you can do around cyber threats. So I just want to tease on a couple of points here about the difference between cyber threats and if you like normal type of risks. The difference with cyber threats are they can be automated. Okay, now that's, that's huge as, as regards to attack thing. They can be automated quite easily. Data collection, they can, they can collect vast amounts of data. They can mine it, they can harvest it, they can do what they want to it, manipulate it in order to, to, to fulfill their gain. They can do this from a distance. They can do this from anywhere in the world potentially. Um, propagation, they can sell ideas and share ideas. So even though one guy might not be able to get all the pieces of the puzzle, when they exchange ideas, they can get, they can get all the pieces of the puzzles required. But the main thing I want to, to, to stress here, when the bad guy finds a weakness, they can exponentially exploit it within seconds from multiple jurisdictions. So if they found a way to take a fiver out of your account and they find it works and it's going under the radar, then they can press a button and that fiver can come out by a million times around the world. Uh, very quickly and very easily. Okay, just summing up here to, to, to finish off. So we have some low-hanging fruit. That's the low-hanging fruit crime that I refer to, things like, it, which is quite mundane these days, carding. Still a lot of money made out of carding. Carding is the technique of stealing, cloning credit cards, using stolen credit card details to buy things, running through that economic model and that things. Cyber espionage. I get contacted quite a bit around this, either to find out if someone has stolen data or they're trying to hire uh, people like myself to actually steal information uh, to find out what's going on in other companies and so on. It is happening, right, uh, out there a lot. Uh, it's more targeted, the sort of stuff we're seeing now. People are going specifically after this particular type of companies to find out. And we say, well, does this stuff really happen? You know, well, if anyone's read Richard Branson's autobiography, they'll see that uh, British Airways hacked into Virgin Airlines systems back in 1993 to find out who was making first class reservations so that they could sell them tickets. This stuff's gone on forever. These are just new techniques, they're automated and they're much easier now to, to run outside side things. We're seeing combination attacks, slow and slow attacks, and we're seeing that the major players are getting involved uh, with the organized crime gangs are taking over them. And that side of things. So what I'll do now is I just want to show you a quick uh, demonstration of what a DDoS attack potentially looks like and, and, and how it can happen. So how easy is it to DDoS somebody? Well, actually, it's as easy as one, two, three. Even you don't have to be a qualified, certified hacker to do this. Um, you simply need to go onto Google or YouTube and type in DDoS tutorial or whatever it happens to be, and you'll find the toolkit, follow the instructions, and it goes generally in two steps. The first step you need to create the virus. Now, you don't have to create the virus if you're going to rent your botnet. But if you want to create your botnet, you want to create a virus which will mean that every infected machine will send back the, it will, send, will be controlled by your command and control server. So, um, the way this works is, I'll just show you a quick example here. Okay, so I've downloaded the toolkit. I click on the file to, to, to kick it off. Straight away, my antivirus is detected, but it's my virus. I know it's okay, so I say ignore it, uh, continue on. I'm now configuring the exe file, the, 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 the execution file, uh, to point to my command and control server. Right? So this is going to be specific to mine. So when I get people then to click on this executable or run it in any way, their machine is fully under my control. I just put in all the defaults because it's too complicated. So I just go to default, 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 uh, round the whole thing, make it nice and easy. Nice mute text string. Just some mad elaborate stuff. So what's this taking? 30, 40 seconds and I've created a virus. Okay, that's my virus created. Now all I need to do is to get you to click on that somehow. And there's a million ways I could do that. I can use other software to send it to you as a graphic, as an Excel spreadsheet, as a Word document, anything like that. You click on it, you don't even see anything, and I have control over your machine potentially from the bandwidth and the power and so on of that. So the next stage, what I want to do is, I want to go into my command and control server, and I want to call up my army and wake them up and get them to do things. That could be spamming, that could be a DDoS attack in this case, right? So we'll see what that looks like. So I'm going to uh, contact these machines through the interface and get them to do uh, a DDoS right up to the edge of it anyway. So now I've installed the software up on Paul C. Dwyer DDoS demo. I go up into there.
This is one called Warbot. It's very common, very easy to use it. I log in. Okay, and now I'm in. And this is the user interface. A bit plainer, a bit more simple or whatever. You can see I've got zero bots online. So just for the purposes of this demonstration, I haven't used any bots, but I can connect to the bots, no problem, and, and just use those. And now if I want to say, for example, load a specific web page on every one of my infected machines, I can put in the URL there. Uh, I can tell it how many bots to use. I can uh, create a report and I can tell it to go off. And what will happen is a particular website, let's say it's ICTTF.org, right, will start appearing and opening on everybody's machine. Obviously, huge traffic can cause the, the site to go down if it's been opened on 10,000 machines or whatever it happens to be in one go, uh, at, at that side of things. I can do uh, different types of attack. We're looking at UDP flood here. Uh, I can pick the strength, I can pick the dots, and all I'm doing is dragging the dial over, doing the piece. And if I click on attack, it'll kick up. So we can do a HTTP flood as a main type of DDoS attack. Type in the name of the web address. So, excuse my friends in Aircom, they're here today as well. I'll be presenting with them later. But this was for an Aircom demo we used. And uh, so we can pick how long I want the attack to go, the strength of the attack, and how many bots I want to use to attack that particular website. And it's a matter of click, and it goes. Right? So it is that simple to perform DDoS attacks. So it's, this isn't a complex thing uh, to get involved in. So. Finally, round attribution. So what do we do? What's the answer to all this? So I can hear and I can tell you all about these problems, but today we're going to talk about these problems in more in-depth, and finally we're going to sum up with some techniques you may be able to take on board and take some valuable knowledge away with you that you can use to do this. So is attribution the answer? Is it, is it going down to your guard station saying, I've been attacked, or phoning them and be putting through to the GBFI or whatever? The guardie do a fantastic job, especially in the GBFI and the, and, and the, the crime unit and so on like that. They're under-resourced, and this particular type of crime as well is very difficult to attribute when you're talking about using Interpol, Europol, uh, cooperation is required all around the, 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 the globe in order to chase a lot of this stuff as well. So it's very, very difficult to go down that road. And if we think about the, the words of Barnes Neville Jones echoing, it's up to you to disrupt this and defend yourself more or less. You know, from the UK side, they're saying, look, you're on your own when it comes to this. So what about defense? Do we get more boxes? Do we buy more technology? Do we put in more IDSs, more firewalls, more IPSs, all that sort of stuff? Is that the answer? Is the answer maybe proactive cyber defense? As uh, one of my favorite ones, the 5th century BC, Sun Tzu in The Art of War, advised foreknowledge. So being proactive, knowing who your enemy may be, and maybe taking them out before they take you out. Is that the answer? So although it's a cool acronym, PCD, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not the answer. Uh, is disruption. So, for example, if you find that you're working for a bank and there's phishing emails going out, do you disrupt that by, for example, maybe filling in thousands and thousands of uh, bogus ones on the website that's harvesting the information and essentially making their information unusable because you've destroyed the information they're collecting by poisoning it with crap, right? Is that the answer? Or is the answer being offensive? Attack them. Take them offline. You know, use some cool tools. You can wipe them off the face of, uh, of the internet. Or is it hybrid cyber defense? So there's some food for thought, which is what I would suggest. And the reason that I've put together the, the, this, this hybrid mix of uh, companies here today, because it takes a number of things to deal with this. It takes people, processes, technology, and so on. So you need the risk management experts. You need training. You need tools. You need DDoS mitigation. You need all these things to have a hybrid cyber defense program. So I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So thank you very much for your time.